Hi, I'm Tessa Davis. I'm a paediatric emergency medicine consultant. This video is going to look at finger flexor tendon injuries in children. We're going to look at the anatomy of the flexor tendons, how to assess them, how to classify the injuries and look at a common, the most common type of flexor tendon injury. So the anatomy, well, there's two flexor tendons for each finger and there's one in the thumb. So in the fingers, which is what we're focusing on today, you've got the flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor digitorum profundus. You've also got the flexor pollicis longus as the only thumb flexor. These flexor tendons, they travel distally from the forearm, they go through the carpal tunnel, and they're named based on the forearm muscles from which they arise. The flexor digitorum profundus, think profound, like deep, arise from the deep layer of the flexor muscles. The flexor pollicis longus of the thumb also arises from the deep muscle layer. The flexor digitorum superficialis is a continuation of the more superficial layer. So the digitorum profundus inserts at the base of the distal phalanx and it flexes the distal interphalangeal joint. The flexor digitorum superficialis tendon, it divides into two slips that wrap around the FDP to insert into the sides of the middle phalanx. And this FDS flexes the PIP joint. We've also got a pulley system here. So the flexor tendons are enclosed in this synovial sheath and it lubricates them and minimizes friction. This pulley system is organized into segments of transverse fibers. So you've got annular pulleys, and then you've also got segments of oblique fibers, which are cruciate pulleys. You've got a combination of both of these throughout. So there's three cruciate pulleys, C1 to three, and five annular pulleys, A1 to five. What these pulleys do is they keep the flexor tendons close to the bone and they prevent bow stringing of the tendon. So we know the anatomy, but we need to be able to evaluate the FDS and FDP. Most commonly closed flexor tendon injuries are because of there's been forced extension while the finger is in active flexion. So the child might present with reduced flexion of the finger or they might have pain when they bend the finger. They might be localised swelling, there may be some open wounds but you need to assess the FDS and the FDP tendons individually. So it's not just enough to watch the child make a fist and think that the tendons are okay, because doing this, you can easily overlook or completely miss tendon injuries. So to examine the FDP, what you want to do is you want to hold the middle phalanx in extension and ask the child to flex the DIP joint. And you can see them doing that here. To check the FDS function, you want to hold all the adjacent fingers in extension and then you release the finger that you want to assess. So you ask the child to flex that free finger at the PIPJ. And it can be difficult to assess tendon function in very young children or uh, uncooperative children. But there's a couple of things that you can do pretty easily without get, getting into the complex testing of the FDS and the FDP. The first thing that you can do is to look at the digital cascade. So the digital cascade is what you can see when the child's hand is in a resting position. In this position, you can see that the finger should have a natural cascade, which progressively increases in flexion from the index finger through to the little finger. And you can see that here. The second thing that you can look at without doing too many complex tests is wrist tenodesis. Now you can see this by squeezing the forearm muscles and looking at the fingers. This can also be used to assess flexor tendon continuity. So if the flexor tendons are intact, the child's finger should flex while the forearm muscles are squeezed. You can test this also in two other ways. So this is extending, um, actively extending or passively extending the wrist. You can see when the wrist extends, the fingers flex. If you've got intact flexor tendons and you've got a relaxed or distracted patient, when you passively extend them, you'll get finger flexion. If you've got damage to the flexor tendons, then the injured fingers usually rest in an extended position when the wrist is extended. You can also see here that the converse is true. So when you flex the wrist, you extend the fingers. And similarly, when you've got intact extensor tendons and passive wrist flexion, you'll get finger extension. But if you've got damaged extensor tendons, which we'll talk about in another video, the injured fingers will rest in a flexed position when the wrist is flexed. It's worth a mention here for wound exploration because if you've got an open wound and concerns about tendon damage, you're going to have to explore it. You need to remember that the tendons move. So if you look into a wound and you see an intact tendon, it doesn't mean that you've excluded a tendon injury. 
if, for example, you've had the wound sustained while the finger is flexed, but you actually examine while the finger is extended, then the level of the tendon that you're looking at won't correspond to where the injury occurred. And so it's really important to get a good history about the mechanism and what the finger position was at the time of injury and put the digit through a range of passive movement while you're examining the wound. And if you're not sure or you can't rely a tendon injury, then definitely make sure you refer the patient to the local hand surgery team. So we've looked at how to assess the wound, how to assess the tendons, and it's important to know how to classify the injuries. So the injuries for flexor tendon injuries are classified into zones. Zone one is the FDP only. Zone two is the insertion of the FDS, and it ends at the distal edge of the palmar crease. Zone three, this begins, uh, this is the PAM and it begins from the proximal end of the first annular pulley and it ends at the distal edge of the carpal tunnel. And zone four is within the carpal tunnel and zone five is proximal to the carpal tunnel. So it's good to know these zones so that when you're describing the injury, documenting or discussing with a specialty that you'll be able to refer to the zones as well as describing the injury. And it's worth a mention of a, the most common paediatric finger flexion injury, which is jersey finger. So you can see here that jersey finger is a zone one injury, which is where you've got dis disruption of the FDP tendon. This injury is usually caused by forced extension of the DIP joint during active flexion. So it's commonly when you've got an athlete's finger caught in another player's shirt, which might happen uh, playing like uh, a tackling sport like rugby. Or if you're, your patient's a climber and they've been tightly holding on a grip with forced extension, then a jersey finger can happen here. The patient with a jersey finger, they might present with pain and swelling to the volar aspect of the DIP joint and sometimes they get some bruising. The finger is usually extended at rest like you can see here and the ring finger is the most commonly affected. You need to evaluate the integrity of the FDP as we've discussed already earlier in the video. When you've got an injured FDP, you're going to produce very restricted or maybe no movement at all. You should be getting an x-ray uh, to rule out an avulsion fracture at the volar base of the distal phalanx. And the treatment of jersey finger may be operative or non-operative, but they need early referral to a hand surgeon for assessment and get appropriate treatment. So many cases require operative treatment, so they'll need surgical intervention to reattach the tendon and to prevent that tendon retraction and optimise function. The prognosis for patients with jersey finger worsens if treatment's delayed and you get severe tendon retraction. The other option is non-operative treatment, so if it's a partial tear, it might be managed conservatively with splinting or physiotherapy. <clears throat> but from a PCD perspective, we need to consider that these are surgical cases until we've sent them to a hand specialist and a hand specialist has, has decided otherwise. So we've looked at a summary of finger flexion, flexor tendon injuries in children. We've looked at the anatomy, we've looked at how to assess them, we've looked at how to classify them, and we've looked at jersey finger as a common example. For more info on this, please see the DFTB post by Sinead Fox and Kate Jackson, which I will link to. Thank you.